Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 503. That's 503 of the Agostino Zynga Show. How you doing? How you feeling? Wherever this may meet you, my friends. Great. Amazing. How am I? You know, doing the best I can with with the time I have available. And of course, drinking myself a nice little mug of hot tea. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like, hit subscribe, and of course, leave me a comment down below with any thoughts, feelings, and suggestions regarding the show. And of course, if you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review, a four-star review, a three-star. Oh, damn, my fans are so dry. But anyway, five, four, four, whatever, yeah? A review on the podcast app because it helped pick out the algorithm and I'll be greatly appreciated. And of course, more importantly, support for your patron is also more than welcome that patreon.com for just agostino you get free access to all my bonus patreon content only available for my patreon subscribers for little as one dollar equivalent of one pound per month don't delay get involved on it today at patreon.com for just agostino you can find a link in the description of this video as well as the description wherever you're listening to this podcast get involved get involved get involved but yeah here we are man we're just smashing through the 500s not really letting up any steam we're just going for it, going for the jugular, doing what we can do and just kind of putting one foot in front of the other and just kind of stepping, moving forward. And that's what worst of us have been doing. Well, most of us, not worst of us, most of us have been doing throughout this entire year or throughout this entire last couple of years. We've just been trying to put one foot in front of the other and just maintain and just make sure that we are somewhat, you know, st- standing after all of this right this is basically what it is you just want to make sure you're standing after everything is said and done and that's what i've currently been doing with this whole podcast and youtube channel so again grateful for your support and everybody tuning in however many however little it may be i'm all immensely great grateful because i know how much content is out there i know how much free brilliant content it does exist out there for you guys to give me any minute of your time is greatly greatly appreciated now do not take that shit for granted at all at all so we have a jam-packed show to get involved in today loads of things to talk about loads of interesting um topics that i have pulled out from the interwebs and stuff that i've kind of been thinking about in general so grab yourself a little drink a little snack wherever it may be get yourself nice and situated maybe bring in the cat you know maybe tell the boyfriend to leave you alone tell the girlfriend to shut up you know um hang up on your mom and your dad whatever it may be and let's just tune in dive on deep and get it started so first things first, if you're watching this or listening to this next day, you would have probably known there was a massive WhatsApp, Facebook and Instagram outage, which basically led everybody to go in to like apps like Snapchat and Twitter to get their social media rocks off and generally just being bored with life in it. Because I think until these apps are sort of taken away from you momentarily, you'd forget how important they are to your kind of day to day, right? In terms of your content, um, what do you call it? your content absorption time or your content enjoyment time whatever it may be especially if you're somebody who thinks you watch a lot of things you don't usually watch a lot of things you maybe check a lot of things on those platforms so maybe it's a clip an IGTV clip whatever it may be it might be somebody you're chatting to on whatsapp and you're exchanging information you're having just a catch up or whatever or memes doesn't matter facebook is all people arguing or whatever those are forms of content but i think for whatever reason we tend to like think content only happens content owns only like youtube and like netflix and all that sort of stuff when it's not like you spending all your time just going through your feed or you know frantically because i've seen people do it on the train they have the instagram up and they'll just be going through everyone's stories and they won't even be checking it it's just like half a second boom 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 boom, smashing it through and of course there might be something they like they'll kind of go back to but usually they're just tapping that thing from the right you know how people would like power use tinder and just be like you know swiping all the way one right and just hoping somebody matches that same way people use instagram stories and stuff so it's not even as if like you're sitting down you're absorbing it but still count up all the times that you're tapping through count all the times you're in the discovery page you're essentially watching a couple of episodes worth of a series every time you go to work every time you're on a loo every time you're just bored and in between things every time you're at work and you're in between tasks you're basically doing that on all those platforms so when those platforms get taken away from you you can just imagine the kind of gap that you have the time gap that's available um the busyness gap the boredom gap that you have now suddenly where you're like oh my god i don't know what to do and you're just stuck 
And this is where I would always come back to people because, you know, I'm an avid reader. I've kind of spent the entirety of my adult life reading. Um, even though I was a crappy student, I always kind of enjoyed the art of reading or the, the love of reading. I kind of always had it in me. And um, there was a time period where I was reading like four to five books per month and then I would post loads of stuff about on social media. Then, of course, I kind of stopped doing it because I felt like it was like a little bit of a, you know, intellectual masturbation sort of thing. So I didn't want to do that anymore. But a lot of people used to always ask me, oh, how do you do it? And used to make it seem as if I was some sort of freak, that I was some sort of special talent. that had some sort of God-given gift to read. And it's like, not really. I just carved out whatever time I was spending on those apps and just devoted it to just reading a bit. So what I would do is I'll just do like a minimum of an hour a day. And then whatever time I would be using on those apps, I'd also add on top. So if it's an hour a day, you're just sitting down on one sitting and doing it. Every time I'd go to a toilet, I'd take a book with me. Every time I'm on the bus, I'd have a book with me. So those little times you have, you usually would be pulling out your phone. I'd just have a book. Don't get me wrong. It looked wanky seeing a dude like myself just standing at a bus up reading a book. I know it, it does come across a little bit um, pretentious, but you could get through a lot of reading just doing that because you're taking away all the time that you would have spent doodling on that, um, you know, twiddling around your phone reading a book or sometimes i wouldn't read i'll just be like you know meditating or thinking about the stuff that i read on the bus earlier letting it kind of marinate in my head maybe thinking through some ideas maybe applying some of the principles to stuff that i've done in my life or things that i've gone through and then little by little you kind of absorb a lot more of the book too because you're not just reading it you just steamroll through it and just prove that you read it you're actually reading it for enjoyment you're reading it to kind of get something out of it but again it's because your attention isn't taken away by other things which also leads me to the thing to you know leads me to another point which is the truth of the matter is especially after this outage i think most of us have realized if you actually want to do great things in the world and you actually want to make a change and you actually want to become become somebody of notoriety or smash whatever field that you're in or really excel in whatever career path you're doing there needs to come and under there needs to come to a point in your life where you just kind of realize that the people that you look up to who are really smashing it they've probably for the most part been able to somehow put some kind of management tools or restrictions on their use of social media that's the only way you get to those kind of positions of course you have to avoid distractions outside of work you can't be getting drunk and high every weekend you can't be going to every social gathering so you have to basically every time any time you have that it's not devoted maybe to your kind of close friends and family you have to pour all into your business all into your vocation your career whatever it may be um your passion project you're going to pour all of it in there and then you might see some results but for whatever reason people think they can be posting on social media they can be keeping up with all the gossip that's going on there all the tea um you know taking part in flipping comments and all that and still thinking you can apply the same level of intensity and dedication to the stuff you're doing and still reach the levels of the people you maybe look up to it just isn't going to happen it really isn't you need to have full attention on that and unfortunately these apps the way they're created they don't really they don't really play that kind of game do you know i mean they're not in the game of allowing you to have like a to have time to do those kind of things it's either you're on my app or you're or you're nothing do you know what i mean that's the issue that they have going on here so what can you do but anyway this is courtesy of sky news it says what's that facebook and instagram are coming back online of course they all should be updated by now check mine and mine slowly but surely coming back but it says facebook and apps and services including instagram and whatsapp are coming back online after six hours of outage that's one of the big reasons why people don't like monopolies as well by the way the fact that Facebook owns um, these two big behemoths of apps in terms of Instagram and WhatsApp, especially because WhatsApp has turned in basically to another social media platform with all their stories and shit. It's not good, right, in the long run, because effectively, if somebody ends up DDoSing um, Facebook, it's going to affect every other platform that they are also in, in part in cahoots with, do you know what I mean, or that they've bought. So, Effect effectively your data is being passed through all three of these companies without your knowledge without your consent on a daily or sometimes on an hourly basis keep that in mind the platforms crashed early monday with users unable to send or receive messages or refresh their news fees facebook chief strategy officer mike um shroppen what's how do you call that mike shof shurop shurop 
it doesn't matter. Um, have blamed the artificial on network issues, but just before midnight, they confirmed the Facebook service is coming back now. May take some time to get 100% to every very small and large businesses, family, and individual dependent on us. I'm sorry. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Facebook engineering is wrong on Twitter to the huge community of people and businesses around the world who helped us we're sorry everyone's saying sorry today um, we've been working hard to restore this access to our apps and services and are happy to report that they're coming back online now thank you for bearing with us that's a really good meme that kid with the house on fire and Instagram and what's up other what you call it are the firemen and it continues it said according to down detector which collects status reports on services 73,804 problems with whatsapp were recorded in a spike at 4 35 p.m which is i guess one of their main times people use it right because it's just before everyone's heading off from work heading out of college and whatnot um 43% of the WhatsApp problems were associated with the app and 28% were related to sending messages. There were more than 58,219 reports of problems on Facebook regarding its website and 17 on the app. Imagine all those mums and dads and aunties and shit are not on Facebook not be able to argue in the evenings. They must have been livid because they probably were in bed by now. So they must have been absolutely spinning spitting feathers and uh, more than five percent of reports were recorded in the peak problems with instagram problems were reported across the world including north and south america europe australia um russia and new zealand so i guess these are probably their biggest markets that's why they're probably pointing them out um people using facebook credentials to log into third party apps such as pokemon go and match masters were also said to be facing issues imagine setting up an account with facebook to play pokemon go just set up and flip an email address with flipping proton mail or something like you're giving these guys too much information and then these are the same people that are also going to be worried about the vaccines like you give these apps and these platforms so many data points about you and who you are as a person they can literally replicate your behaviors without you even realizing they're doing it and yet you don't want to get a little jab in your arm to be able to go to a flocking nightclub it's like uh, i know both things are bad but jesus christ guys shares of facebook which are nearly 2 billion daily active users closed to 4.9 lower on monday it comes as the company was also under pressure from testimony of whistleblower who claims to choose who claims it shows profit over safety security experts tracking the situation said the disruption could be a result of an internal mistake or the sabotage by an insider would be theoretically possible people are alleging that this lady that came out who i think has kind of come out with her name and who she is um who basically has told people everything they should know about how facebook operates about how they kind of um enjoy the fact that people are so divisive and argue a lot on the platform because it obviously drives engagement she people are now saying that, it's, that they're somehow tied together that the interview dropped in the same day that facebook kind of went down um i don't really see how true that is but it could be who knows the shady business out there in the social media landscape um jonathan zitrain director of harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society described the situation by tweeting Facebook basically locked its keys in its car. Um, Reuters news agency reported Facebook employees who are not identified as saying they believe the problems were caused by an internal routing mistake to an internet domain. Um, this was a compounded by the failures of internal communication tools and other services that depend on a domain to work. A similar issue with a free apps recorded in April 2019 when they crashed for about two hours. So I guess it's not in their best interest to say it was a DDoS attack, right? Because they don't want hackers to get the idea that they can ddos attack a such a large company like facebook with all the security measures they have in place so they're kind of coming out with this kind of internal domain issue kind of thing saying oh how internal apps were not working either it was an internal issue it wasn't anyone else outside because obviously if that happens and this that kind of a security flaw or breach that would i guess negatively affect their stock price maybe negatively affect how people are kind of positioned in terms of their stock when it comes to facebook and the other apps that they bought so it's in their best interest to kind of obfuscate the truth right um half truths here and there because they don't really owe anybody an explanation they can do what the hell they want um and it is what it is people keep moving on but how depressing did you feel or how depressed did you feel when you realized that your favorite apps had taken up had gone down and that you were left completely bored and that if you came to a realization that wow these apps have a lot more power and a lot more influence and a lot more saying what i do day to day than i actually am led to believe um i think this is probably a great time for most people to probably start waning off of these apps in general again i tend to kind of just use them as a place to kind of chat shit and hang out whatever but not necessarily as my only platform for entertainment but i know some people don't so everyone's different when they do stuff but i don't know man there should be 
there should be a way you should kind of withdraw yourself a little bit from these apps and not be so super dependent on them, especially since they share all your data between all three and every other person, maybe any other third party place as well that they get sold out to because, you know, at the end of the day, data is king. And, you know, the more data that people have on you, especially these apps, the more money they're able to make and people just seem to be willing to just give that shit away in it. Like, but what can you do? What else we have here? Oh, we have this news, right? This is kind of slightly old news, but there's a little bit of an update today. I'm not sure if the update is true based off a post I saw on a forum. But essentially, there's this story which I've stumbled upon on YouTube about this guy called Omi and the Hellcat. So Omi in the Hellcat. Um, let me get this article up here, courtesy of the New York Times. My thing ain't working. But this is courtesy of the New York Times. It says, um, uh, those fancy cars he flaunted on YouTube, a 30 million fraud scheme paid for them, the US says. A flamboyant YouTuber known as Ermine Hellcat was charged with illegally selling his copyrighted TV shows and movies through an online service, prosecutors said. So I'm not sure if you've known this guy, he's like a bigger black dude from America who's known for like waddling around um, his massive estate and mansion somewhere with all these amazing white cars, you know, all these different models and brands. I'm pretty sure everything was white, massive house but he's only one of the only kind of i'm rich off social media and doing my little business things online who i saw who was very upfront about what he actually did and it was actually seemed like a legitimate business even though it seemed highly illegal it did seem like he was actually selling something people actually wanted and at the time i think when i first discovered him he was selling these kind of these sticks that he kind of preloaded with content and then i guess that then went on to being sticks that he like kind of loaded with uh patches that you could watch different kind of tv shows and things on whatever it may be and of course if you're somebody that doesn't want to pay full price for cable or just wants to have a full selection of stuff and pay a discounted rate then you'd go and obviously hire your service and do it and i guess you know something like that especially if it's kind of priced at like a nominal fee um you're gonna make a lot of money really really quickly and he managed to do so um you know he racked up the millions and then he tried to kind of invest that money into kind of legitimate stuff like houses and gyms and no is it gyms or auto body shop. I forgot what it was it's a long time ago I watched that video but in general he kind of tried to make that money and then flip into other things but he's very upfront about business again one of the only ones you'd see who was kind of legitimately was it a good businessman but he kind of obviously had clearly something to sell he wasn't just selling you um a course on how to sell a course you know how those kind of flipping fraud influencer youtube people do but of course what he was doing was highly illegal i kind of had the feeling it was he doesn't think so and the feds are basically come after him and they've come after him in a big way i think his house has been already raided or his mansion has been raided like three or four times he's most of his cars and assets have been seized and now they're kind of getting to the point where they're trying to offer him a plea deal or say if he wants to go to trial and he's now having to decide what he wants to do going forward but let me just read a bit of the statement and i'll kind of update you on the latest goings on so this is part of new york times um it says on youtube he was known as omi in the hellcat a flamboyant business mogul in a diamond study jewelry who commanded a fleet of luxury cars including lamborghinis ran his own clothing line and restaurant but even as he lo lounged in his sprawling suburban home sorry oof Showed off his rotating collection of high-end cars, he acknowledged that the federal government was closing in. In June, he posted a video titled the FBI is Back, in which he filmed himself wearing a large diamond encrusted pendant that bore his brand name Reloaded. In a dual mode, um, he warned his 790 subscribers that the FBI had seized more than 30 of his cars and millions of dollars from his bank account, that he was going to be indicted on charges that could include money laundering. He says, I've been, I've been kind of depressed about it, he confessed. On Wednesday, the federal prosecutor said that they charged Omi, whose real name is Bill Omar Cascarilco, Carasquillo, Carasquillo, two of his associates in a scheme that involved illegally selling copyrighted video content to thousands of subscribers on Mr. Carasquillo's own streaming service, which was called at various times Reboot, Gears Reloaded, and Gears Reloaded. The scheme netted Carasquillo and his associates more than thirty million dollars from about 2016 until November 2019. He was living better than most rappers. Let's just say that. Um, according to prosecutors, Mr. Carasquillo, 35, of Newsboro, New Jersey, used the money to buy houses, dozens of cars 
cars and couldn't once he regularly flaunted on YouTube. So he flipped that money, of course, into depreciating assets with cars, but he then flipped it into real businesses, which I'm sure is still making him a lot of money in the background. Uh, Mr. Cascarello could face a life in prison if he's convicted of charges with his crude conspiracy, violating digital me me millennium, copyright act, reproduction of pr protected work, access to device fraud, making false statements to a bank and money laundering. So there's a lot of really dodgy, nefarious things, which I think I kind of touched upon that guy called um, Spencer Corella, Co Cornell, I think is that his name. He kind of did a really good breakdown of it and basically said, even though I mean, Hellcat is kind of pleading naivete and ignorance. Well, he said naivety isn't kind of, um, what does it say? Isn't an excuse to break the law. But he's, he is claiming a lot of, he is basically saying, I don't know about a lot of things. And basically saying that this is a loophole. I was able to exploit it. And the Fed is just angry. So he might have a point to stand on. But the fact that they're coming after him with such ferocity and the fact that they're trying to make a big example of him, maybe because he was really flashy and he did kind of throw it in people's face wealth and stuff which i think is an interesting thing to think about right because it does appear like it does appear for whatever reason if you're from a minority background and you happen to be very successful and you happen to show that wealth on social media you tend to get a lot more scrutiny from the you know from the feds um in general than your white counterparts because i think of somebody like a What's his face? Um, what's that guy's name, man? The white dude with all the chicks that surround him. Oh, you know what I'm talking about, innit? What's his name? The one that everyone says is broke now, but he's, he, and supposedly his dad is the one that funneled all his money and his dad's a scam artist, blah, blah, blah. Uh, doesn't matter. Anyway, he was on Joe Rogan a couple of times, but that guy, right? He's not got in, he's not getting the same sort of attention that Omni the Hellcat's getting in a legal way, leading proceeding way. Maybe there is a case being built up about him behind the scenes, but I've not heard one thing of him being kind of punished for his quote unquote crimes that everyone keeps alleging he does. Because I think the, the premise around him is basically uh, Mark Belzerian, is it? Mark Belzerian was a Belzerian, that guy, yeah, that him. Essentially, what the idea or the update around him is that even though he presents himself as some sort of like, I think he says he made his money um, in poker, right? But allegedly people, internet sleuths and detectives and whatnot are, are alleging that his actual wealth comes from his dad, who was also a quote unquote scam artist who I think went to prison. And that's where he got most of his money from. And most of the stuff that he flaunts that he says is his isn't actually his, it's all rented, which, which is interesting part because, you know, you, you don't have to be, a flipping Ivy League graduate to know if you looked at him that he didn't own any of that shit. Do you know what I mean? You you know it is all kind of a ruse on social media to look a certain way because we know what actual wealthy people actually look like. And I don't know, you never really got the fact that he was wealthy. You just got the idea that maybe he had access to these places. He was obviously well connected because of who he hanging around with. He obviously ran a really tight ship in terms of how he dealt with the women and whatever. Yeah, you know I mean, yes, cool. But in terms of him being ultra wealthy, I didn't really kind of get that vibe from him. So maybe he could be excused for kind of obfuscating the truth and being a little bit, you know, purposefully misleading people in that regard. But still, there's no criminal proceedings being brought up against him. But Omin the Hellcat is getting, you know, literally rained down on um, by everybody <laughs> that can rain down on him. And so much to the point now where he's saying he's depressed and shit. They want to throw him into prison. Like, it's just mad. And again, this is kind of white collar crime. Usually people kind of get away with this with paying hefty fines and maybe spending a couple of years in prison and whatnot. But they are throwing mad numbers at him. I mean, football numbers at him in terms of times he's going to spend in prison. And it's like, I don't know. It feels like a little bit of a, what's that word called? not a harmless crime but who's it actually affected what big corporations who were able to kind of fleece their kind of viewer customers out of a, a few extra bucks for their bill on cable and whatnot who gives a shit but they're coming after him with a ton of bricks even though again that damn bilzerian guy he's the one flying out young women all over the world i don't know what they're if they what their deal is and what's going on over there i don't even want to get into that then he's also kind of, you know, perpetuating this idea that he's a poker millionaire. Then I think he started that weed business and he's probably got a crypto and NFT like all the other flipping influencers that scam people do. So it just feels a bit odd. I mean, so far we've not seen the Omen Haircuts NFT or crypto. Have I, have you seen one? It doesn't seem like he's a, he's a scammer in that way. He just kind of likes buying nice expensive. Again, that's the thing. I'm not a fan of this. I would never have done this. I would have kind of kept my mouth shut and just kept to move on and kept it moving. 
but some people do enjoy flaunting their wealth like excessively like to the point where he looks ridiculous right he's wearing like 17 chains and shit it's like come on relax but some people like doing it so i don't think you should be punished for wanting to wear your wealth especially if again you're from where he's from you've grown up the poor and legitimately these things hold a lot of value for you this is your way of kind of you know telling yourself that you made it you know what i mean you've definitely made something at yourself when everyone thought you couldn't do it and then people are then using it as a negative to then kind of dig into your pockets to see what you're up to so what if you would have just kept quiet and just moved to bali and didn't show anything that you kind of had they would have left him alone but that's not fair either, do you know what I mean? Because if you are doing something, for, you know, something flipping untoward and you happen to live a kind of modest lifestyle, you should also be, you know, um, met with the full force of the law. But this just feels a little bit like they're picking on him, just a little bit. It continues that digital piracy schemes have proliferated in the recent years and 2019 report released by the US Chambers of Commerce estimated that they cost the American economy at least 29 point billion a year. It doesn't matter though. They write it all off again, give them more flipping subsidies and loans. It doesn't, this is all gay. It's like, after you watch Squid Game, you realise, man, this, it's just all nonsense. It's just all money on the screen. In an in, in an indictment, prosecutor said Mr. Crascarello, uh, Carasquillo, sorry, um, and his associate Jesse Gonzalez of Pico Rivera, California, and Michael Baron of Richmond, NY, were must forfeit nearly 35 million in assets, including more than 50 cars and motorcycles and tons of properties in Philadelphia. Yeah, they just did too much, in it? Remember all those old kind of not old, not those the early series of like narcos when they the, the main guys would get pissed off if the underlings were starting to buy like crazy shit because they draw the attention of the feds, which it always did. But people just can't help themselves. There is something about humans, especially if you're dealing in that kind of illicit crime and money is coming in hand over fist. There's something that you just can't help yourself. There's some driving force, some fire in your belly that's just telling you, buy it, buy it, buy it. Because you know how good it's going to look. You know how good it's going to feel to kind of drive down your estate or your hood or your barrier or wherever you're from, right? In the flipping drop top Lambo. People that kind of counted you out and shit and go beep, beep, beep. You know how good it's going to feel. But little do you know, that's going to cause you so much pain down the line. You might legitimately die off the back of it. Do you know what I mean? That's how crazy it is. But they just can't help themselves. It's like a moth, you know, it's like a moth to a flame. Do you know what I mean? Um, you can't go... It says here, you, you can't just go and monetize someone else's copyrighted content with impunity. Of course, said Bradley S. Benavides, the acting special agent in charge of the FBI. He said, that's the whole point of securing copyright. Dante Moses, a classical lawyer, said his client denied the charges. He said, let's see what the, the lawyer for Omi um, Helcott said. He said, Mr. Kakarola tapped into a brand new, unregulated industry and was very successful. Most people are called pioneers when they do that. Omar is called a criminal. The government assumes that my client is not smart enough to do legally because of his background. He is and will prove that okay let's see so the other update about this which is kind of blew my mind again it's a forum post i'm not going to show or link to it because i don't know if it's true but allegedly omina helka has been offered a deal by the feds right which is usually what they do if they kind of racked up a big case against you they'll usually offer you a plea deal or some regard so you can you know take a lesser sentence maybe pay a more of a fine you know they will try and work something out but effectively they've still brought you down they've done the job but you know in an interest of kind of getting this the, the case kind of tied up and you know into a nice crisp bow and getting the people that obviously brought you down a promotion they'll offer you a plea deal so allegedly they're offering Omi and the hellcat the following two years in prison um, or 20 months and they keep all the possessions cars homes and properties and youtube channel and bank accounts right no so, so yeah they're offering him see it so what 17 no they're, they're offering her 17 years in prison yeah 17.5 years in prison if he just confesses 17 and a half which is 18 years or he takes um or he takes 20 months and they keep all the possessions cars homes properties and youtube channels and bank accounts supposedly he turned it down he turned down both offers right um uh, you know so he turned down the 18 years of, of course and he may turn down the 20 months and go straight to trial so obviously the 18 years is ridiculous because he's essentially going to admit his guilt and spending 18 years in prison is just mad um but he also might turn down 20 months he's that certain that if he goes to trial he can win which is usually nuts because usually if the feds give you those kind of plea deals they usually give it to you because under their remit under their guise of what they know the law talking with the prosecution maybe talking with the judge whatever and just analyzing past cases i don't know wherever they're going to take the court wherever they're going to take the case to and what court is going to be how the jury might decide they've got some things that they work in they kind of consider 
So if they're offering you that sort of time, that usually means you're not good. You're probably going to get worse than that if you go to trial. So if they offered him 18 years, he might get double that if he goes to trial, maybe more, maybe life. It's just it's nuts like that. So the fact that he's willing not to take the 20 month is maybe an indication of his kind of entrepreneurial um, risk adverse, no, not uh, obviously no risk seeking kind of personality that he has in order to get involved in kind of that copyright streaming, illegal streaming of stuff online in the first place, right? You have to have a you have to have to, have to you have to have some massive cojones on you to do that kind of um, move and that kind of hustle in the first place. So it's no surprise that you'd want to turn the deal down. But I was just looking at thinking, yikes, this guy who's been making money on the internet which is really difficult online you know figuring stuff out um find a little niche been you know enjoying the good life buying every car, new cars every week waddling around his mansion with all these massive chains on probably getting to smash through all the baddest bees in whatever place that he lives is suddenly now going to face the prospect of maybe going to prison for flipping you know 30 plus years or 20 months and he's deciding maybe to reject both deals and just go straight to the trial but again if he wins he's going to be a legend do you know what i mean but surely if you're an entrepreneur of his ilk you will take the 20 months to just say you know what even to take all my stuff i'm going to prove when i come back because for sure just on youtube alone he'll be able to make a good low good amount of money telling his story of how he survived in prison what he learned da, 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 da. but for sure he could if he's been able to make this amount of money because that's usually what happens isn't it? if you're an entrepreneur or somebody that's been able to make you know have a small business whatever it may be there is a big likelihood that you are able, you are able to replicate your success if somebody takes you back down to zero because you just have that in you you have that genesis qua you have that gene you have that hustle mentality you may be good with numbers you may be resourceful you may be super intelligent whatever there's something about you that is suited to that kind of line of work so to someone taking all your possessions away and making stuff from zero isn't really going to change much so yeah mad respect to Omi the hellcat from afar brother but take the 20 months mate Tw take the 20 months and just lick your wounds and come back stronger next time that's what i would say but again what do i know move on move on move on what else do we have here oh yes we have the best news of the day so obviously over the weekend um Bergheim happened right reopening reopening weekend everyone looked like they had a great time and whatnot from the clips i've seen online there was mad flipping instagram stories that you know i'm not going to show because i don't get people in trouble and stuff or people kind of recording indoors of course you can't see nothing um because they kind of cover up your camera but you still kind of get a vibe of what's happening on the dance floor and whatnot and it was great to kind of hear everyone whistling shouting getting really crazy because the thing that you have to realize when you go in there it's like obviously every area in the or every city major city in the world has their kind of premier clubs that people go to where everyone's usually having a flipping way of a time but that's probably one of the only mega clubs i've been to again mega clubs like places that i got maybe a thousand plus people where legitimately everybody's dancing and it's such a freaky feeling especially if you're from a hmm somewhat pretentious city like i'm from in london right where you really have to kind of seek out the right club nights the right night clubs the right people to have like a really sick raving experience you can't just go into places blindly and have a great time it's just not gonna happen even places like fabric which i'm kind of falling back in love with you can't just go in there randomly and expect to have a good and a great night you have to be sure on the night you choose what day it is what time you go who you go with all these things play a huge part in what you're gonna in what how much fun you're gonna have but Bergheim might be one of the only places i've been to where legitimately doesn't matter where who you're going to see you can go in there blind which i've done a couple of times on purpose and you're just gonna have a crazy time and it's always electric to see to kind of walk in and see that many people dancing and flipping going crazy no one standing by the booth and trying to get dj's attention just just got, just having their away at a time themselves i fucking love that shit so obviously seeing those videos and hearing people in the background screaming was absolutely sick to see um so i'm gonna quickly run through a few things because of course you know i'm obsessed with that place as you can tell with the amount of videos i've spoken about on my channel and stuff i've spoken about on my podcast it is what it is if this is not the kind of content you enjoy please fast forward because i'm going to be wanking over this for a while but before I go into some of the content pieces that I found online about it, I'm thinking not really too sure when to go. Um, there's two options on the kind of docket. There's option one is to go the last weekend of the of the climax that they kind of announced now, which is I think starring Gerd and a few other people that are obviously gonna be happy to see. 
or to go f- in the first weekend of the new month of like November so the following weekend what they'll probably announce that I'm guessing in the middle of the month around the 17th 18th issue looks like they've re- they announced a new set of dates so I'm thinking of maybe doing that instead and then what I'm thinking of doing is instead of usually whenever I go whenever I've been to Berlin I usually do like a full week I gotta do like a Thursday to Tuesday and then the Tuesday to wind down you know kind of um, wind down or come down from wherever I've been on but this time I'm thinking to maybe do like a Friday, Saturday, early morning, like Friday, early morning or Saturday, early morning, fly in, go straight there and then kind of maybe get a hotel room on the Sunday or something to sleep in or on the Monday to sleep in or whatever. Right. Do you know what I mean, but just go straight in from like the Saturday into there. Do you know what I mean, and not kind of spend because usually whenever I go on a Thursday, I kind of spend place my time in other places. I might go to Palomas. I might go to Club Division Air. I might go to Roses, that amazing bar in um, Kreutz. Is it Kreutz or Kreutz? I don't know what it is, but it's a really cool bar. It's all red and shit. I might, I might go see some of my friends at the Dorf. Right, there's always places I go check out, but I'm thinking I might just go straight there, and then of course maybe of course see just see my friends at the Dorf instead, and not go to all the other places like Same Heads and maybe Eight Millimeter Bar that I'm a big fan of. So I'm, I don't know. I'm in two minds. I'm not really sure what to do. So if you got any recommendations or where, if I should just maybe wait for the beginning of the month of of November to go, or if I should book in that last day at the end of the month, which I think is like the thirtieth or whatever, let me know in the comments. I'd be greatly, greatly appreciated. But jumping on in, obviously first first things first. The queues were absolutely insane. I took a little video of it. Somebody uploaded it on their Instagram account. Um, the queue it, it looked nuts it looked legitimately like nutty 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 and this maybe is a good indication of just how great of a place it is that people after all this time again because you know the UK or London has been open for a while in terms of clubbing experiences so if you wanted to go and party you could have gone there were tons of illegal events happening all over Europe for the most part especially in Berlin there was tons of people doing parties and like abandoned flipping um, what they call bomb shelters and shit and warehouse spaces people renting Airbnbs there were things happening out there were obviously outdoor um, open open air sorry events are happening but to some people to still have this appetite to queue at this level especially for the opening night knowing how chocolate block is going to be it just shows you you know how this place is on another level and just the dedication of people to go out at night <laughs> in berlin it's just it's like no other in it i think i read, read a tweet this is my tweet here it says something about max capacity at Berghain is probably anywhere between 1500 and 2000 depending on the day and judging by how strict they are at the door in general once it's four it's four and people tend to stay for hours and days so waiting in queue like this is pure dedication yeah because i think this picture if i'm not mistaken was taken when obviously this guy um m zapped um says the max capacity of reach is still this queue so i'm assuming at this point the max capacity 1500 is already reached and people are just waiting for the one in one out thing so whoever leaves that's when they decide to let you in and most places in germany or in berlin specifically they're quite finicky and there's a lot of kind of um they don't like bending the rules so if they if if it says 1500 they're only going to let you in if two people leave. Do you know what I mean? It might be for every two people that leave, one person goes in. It might be even that mad. That's how kind of strict they are with those kind of things. So you can only imagine how long people are waiting for. And usually anyway, in general, Fridays and the Saturdays are, especially nights, are usually the worst times to go in terms of queuing because the queues are always crazy because beforehand, the pandemic wise, that's when everyone, tourists like myself, would go and fly in. So if you were a bit smarter, you would maybe wait until the morning, but of course you didn't want to waste time and not be able to party. So it's a, it's a kind of two-edged sword. If you stay in the queue for ages and wait for your turn to get in, or you come later at the night, or later in the morning and then going that way like maybe maybe like an early sunday morning or maybe late sunday evening um yeah you know what i kind of mean like the, in that kind of way that's when maybe you can kind of get a chance to get in that way but jesus christ look at the queue look how people and again i think this is the video right yeah look how much people is in there and that's going all the way back to that's going like way far back the taxi rank they're spiraling around i think i saw one that was bending around the corner that is a hefty queue and again it's not single file so that's a lot of people mm-hmm. jesus christ so yeah big up that then of course on instagram a couple of people posted some great pictures this chick here pays with some really awesome ones um u-f-o-k-k-r and um, obviously pictures outside the iconic picture standing outside the queue that'll be me very soon 
on the way there i'm assuming this is a kind of um qr code that you get um when you have to register on online there i guess that's for your to to basically account for you actually being there in the first place and then you have to have your vaccination passport on your covid app from wherever country you're from and then what else is there to do obviously your id and something else but it's a really good video check out the burger knife well, burger knife. the burger knife website is a cool little skip comedy skit they put together that kind of details what you need to bring when you're there um and then of course you've got the young lady there walking everyone likes a good walking feet thing you've got a wristband here um that everyone obviously collects and keeps with them i still got mine from february 2020 so you know i'm gonna about to do the same thing as well so no shame in my game there you've got pictures i think early morning or maybe on the way there coming back where you're just you know bleary eyed and trying to just keep one foot in the other make sure that you get home you've got of course the um the kind of requisite picture of you maybe waiting outside of your apartment for somebody to have the keys or maybe you just want to come down before you sneak back in and your parents don't realize you went outside anywhere and then she's got here a cheeky picture we don't obviously meant to have of you um taking the lens off and taking a picture of your bag inside the loo as you do whatever you need to do so some awesome pictures from that young lady moving on we've got a great picture of marcel deepman and ben clock standing outside the Burkine too they were playing back to back that night so they were obviously over the moon about that and about being there hanging around being friends and stuff obviously as you can see ben clock and marcel deepman played at 10 so they played all the way until flipping that what that's that's saturday leading into sunday so they played all the way until close basically in the main room at burkine so yeah big up them man the caption's quite funny though together reunited they both live in the same city and this is the first time they've seen each other during the whole pandemic but you know i don't know standard djing shit in it i guess in that regard um that's when you know you're not really friends in it when you only bump into each other when you go outside again that's a clear indication that maybe the friendship isn't as deep as you think you got um roxy moore of course who played there too what time did she play she played there at 11 um nice little set there as well as people are coming in she played in the main room burger which she says she doesn't really do the caption says i choose to come to the classic dj photo in front of the big daddy house i don't think that's a bad thing i think this is on honestly if there's one thing that i guess with stand-up comedians right um a lot of people a lot of uh, a lot of the kind of chatter with other stand-up comedians is that they hate comedians who do that pose where they kind of take a picture of them from the back looking out onto the crowd with the thousands of people kind of screaming their name or the other one which is really cringe where you face the camera and kind of do that weird kind of soy boy face like, i mean no one likes that shit but if there's one place where you're meant to kind of take a picture and kind of soak in the moment it would be like a madison square, madison square garden um maybe the royal albert hall here in the uk and of course, if you're DJing, you know, the Bergheim and stuff, you're meant to take those pictures. Because again, you're not, you can't take anything else. You can't take a picture in a booth. You can't take a picture in a green room or whatever else you're going to be in there. So the one time where you can maybe say, oh my God, I'm so proud of myself of having this achievement because everyone's queued up outside to go inside. Even if you've got a guest to spot, you still have to queue. There is no special kind of place where you can kind of float in, in through the flipping roof or the flipping place, whatever it may be. You're still having to queue. Everyone's been there as a customer, as a fan. So for you to finally have the ability to maybe go and play there, play some records, it's going to be feeling amazing. It's going to feel so gratifying. So being able to stand in front and take that picture is cool because it's a timestamp. It's something to remember and say, wow, I remember that day. You know what I mean? All the memories come flooding back. I know when I look at my pictures, the same thing happens. So I don't think this is cringe. I think this is definitely one of the ones that should be allowed to take but i think the other ones again when you're like you know standing with a jesus pose you know carl cox style on the dj booth it's a little bit like relax do you know what i mean relax you just play other people's songs you know they're important play the tunes and keep it moving but you know maybe i'm wrong here it continues to says as you know her caption says as you know i'm more of a uh, panorama bar regular i was a special it's, it was a special gig for me to play four hours of pounding techno that i want to celebrate here and um, thanks to all the fabulous ravers and the great friends present at this unique journey that was a big fun and welcome back nightlife you were missed that must have been nerve wracking right if you're used to playing panorama bar as a regular which is usually house disco indie pop whatever right indie dance whatever all that kind of stuff right new disco um itello all that good shit imagine then trying to pivot and play a real banging techno set for four hours and not just any techno set right a techno set that can make 
the Bergheim room rock and move because I'm assuming there are certain tracks that you play in some techno clubs that you can't play there because of just the, the sonics and the you know how it kind of reverberates around the room and how people react to it it's just certain factors that you have to kind of figure out how they work and you won't know that until you play there so when someone offers you an opportunity to do so you're not going to turn it down but you're also going to be super super nervous like oh my god how am I going to play that sort of thing but I guess that's what a great DJ does isn't it you've always got that kind of set in the back of your head so I'm sure she probably had an idea of what she would play if that if chance ever did come about and then when it did come about you know what I mean everyone's kind of happy let's see if there's any reviews of people that were there yep someone said here you nailed it enjoyed it so much um that's in french i can't read that je, oh, bravo je trop ami voir sa ambulance so i don't know what it says <laughs> you're on fire you're amazing someone says here yes love to see this da, 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 da. any more reviews so yeah everyone seemed to be really happy roxy more set there it looks like mi amor no more comments there. you nailed this hey, yeah nothing else right cool no more other comments from early on in the day 15 you nailed it you nailed it you nailed it but uh, loads of emojis everyone seemed really happy about that so big up roxy moore for doing her thing then you got a funny post here because you've hector oaks he played too and he made this post um which says no darkness no light we'll shout out light um is that so i say no darkness no darkness night no darkness night we'll shout out our light okay cool um cats because of hector oaks he played too what time did he play double check here he played Berghain just before Roxy Moore oof that's a tough one to follow isn't it first time playing in that big room in it and then after you after you come Stingray it's like Jesus Christ throwing the deep end this is it um, his caption says the following one day around 29, 2009 I stepped from I stepped for the very first time on the floor of the, this building this one day changed my life forever and I decided that I have to devote myself to the art of playing music for people to help them to know themselves to help them to be free like I felt this day you know Hector's a bit you know this is the height of pretentiousness he can get a little bit wafty and you know all this sort of shit but i get it i get the sentiment when you do go there for the first time i think my first time i've been 2008 a year before that you do kind of come away with it thinking that you've kind of finally found your calling and you just want to kind of do everything in your power to get to the point where you're able to play in this kind of places so i understand when you finally do get there it must feel so overwhelming but you know yeah it's a little bit cringe but you continue um i know that for many of us this is just another club but here i met every single people or the most people in my life outside of my family here i learned things that i would have never learned because of it and become a big part of who i am you know the rest meet you under the fucking strobe like okay cool fred perry the where people say push over the limit going to some strobes on 24th May, the deepest darkest of the life duh, duh, duh. what do people say here yes 100 similar emotions three hours of dancing music was like three years successful therapy thank you for the catharsis yesterday everyone seemed to have a good time good reviews on there it looks like agm what else people say here the deepest dark duh, duh, duh. nothing more else was said here push over the limit no one else said any more stuff about him goosebumps Push a limit. Da, 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 da. Some Spanish words here from some fellow country people. I'm assuming. Bop bidi bop bidi bop. Nobody listens to techno. You know what that means. Um, but yeah, he had a good time. And then I think the last one here is, of course, the legend that is Steffi. She posted a picture of herself. Uh, can't wait to be back. In my favorite brief after so many months. I'm on. I'm on an eighteen. I'm on at eighteen hours. Let's go and remember. Let's make techno colorful again. So that was cool to see her there. And then of course she posted the aftermath of it, which is just thanks with the wristband. You know, nothing more needs to be said. Comments are going off. Love you. Great set. Hammer. That was amazing. You know, fire emojis, heart emojis, heart eyes emojis. People are just yeah, this you know, it's Steffi, man. You can't go wrong with her, in it. You know she's gonna bring it. That one DJ I'd go to see blindly anywhere play. So yeah, big up everybody that made that an absolute barnstorm on the event. It's got me pumped, it's got me hyped. I can't wait to go. I'm legitimately planning my trip to the finest details, like I said. I'm not just sure whether I'm gonna do the last month the last yeah the last weekend of the month which is this one here 
or if not, if I'd wait for the new program for November to come out. No, I'm not gonna wait. Actually, I'm just gonna book it anyway. I'll just do the f the following weekend. So this is the last one of the month, which is um, Saturday the thirtieth of October. Um, Berkine features Baker, Cressida, Fatty Mohan, Luke Slater, Legend, Matrix Man. What do you wanna see? Nanny H, Rod Had, and in Panorama Bar you got Cynthy, FKA dot MF4A, who I found courtesy of Whore how you pronounce that flipping online radio show with in the bathroom he's six i would like to see him god jansen of course i'm a big fan of more Ilian is awesome palms tracks you know that wagwan and robin flugel nothing more needs to be said album just came out recently too that was absolutely sick so i don't know whether or not it's this weekend the 30th of october or if it's the following one let's see what the plan is what goes forth but yeah the opening of Berkheim look absolutely fantastic and i'm um, honestly can't wait to be back there very soon Moving on, moving on deep, moving on now, but moving on deep. What else we want to talk about here? Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh, yeah, this is interesting, isn't it, right? So, this is courtesy of Resident Advisor. Ticket platform Dice buys Boiler Room, right? I couldn't think of two more um, interesting people to kind of link up in this sort of way, innit? but this is a deal which was confirmed by Resident Advisor by sources that both companies arrives after DICE recently secured 122 million venture capitalist investment. So they're making it seem like they purchased Boiler Room for 122 million, but I don't think they did. It's probably far less than this, but still, regardless. Um, UK-based ticketing merch and streaming platform DICE has acquired Boiler Room for an underscore sum. Um, confirmed to Resident Advisor by sources that both companies, the deal arrives as DICE um in, moves into hosting ticket live streams of events really sources say that boiler room will return its full team retain its full team of staff and its london office Oof, hope they do didn't bear people get laid off anyway before that so this is not really that much of a thing to kind of like, oh am i not mistaken did i did read that somewhere that bear people got laid off and then they try to make it seem like they kept a lot of people i don't know but i do know that there was always a vacations vacate vacations vacations vac 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 vaccinations why can't i say that word um <laughs> i know there's always vacancy that's the thing no, I, i've missed it out i know there's always vacancies at a place i'd apply a couple of times here and there because i had some friends out working they never really obviously worked out because they probably have thousands of people going through and, and, and applying you know you just imagine everyone that goes to the room and witnesses it. it's like oh my god i want to work there so um that was never a go but it always had flipping you know vacancies there all the time so who knows what's true and what's not but um, it continues as the news comes only days after dice announced it had secured a 122 million in investment by lead capital softbank's vision fund 2 um another of the investors in the future shape um the company run by former apple executive tom F faddle who co-invented the iphone faddle's also joined the board at dice dice's founding um came from softbank vision 2 launched in 2019 to event technology startup it says my experience when taken talking to phil the, the day of dice was inspiring and immediately recognized how boiler room is and how much important potentially has the boiler room found the blaze believers in the press conference or oh, blaze is balling out in it if people hated blaze already because they say he's a rich boy comes from a privileged background then he shouldn't be having that platform honestly some of the rhetoric or some of the talk around boiler room on social is just so weird isn't it like does it really matter if this guy's a tory if he's rich if he's whatever like does it matter really if he's been able to provide a platform that's essentially launched the careers of several people that i know of off offhand right legitimately that have kind of been able to take up djing full time because of a sick set they had on boiler room that went viral for whatever reason like does it matter like he's creating a platform that would have give that's given more chances to djs than any other club that's ever existed in the history of london especially right we don't have flipping residency programs um people don't care for residents they always they just want to see fucking ricardo Villa lobos play a fabric all the time right we don't really have a real good culture and people going to clubs and just trusting the programming of a club it's changing a bit now but in general like how would you've gone from like a low tier mid tier dj to a kind of touring the world and having you know agents and having sponsorship how do you do that it's quite hard to do that in the uk it really really is difficult unless you make a track or whatever it's hard to do so the fact that he provided that platform that allowed people to see people find new space like for again i don't think i would have gone to robert johnson if it wasn't for resident advisor right them featuring robert johnson talking about how good it is and then me seeing the inside of it via yeah, inside of it via boiler room or i might have seen like a gerd jensen and a atta set back to back or something on the boiler room and then i went to go visit it like these kind of things are super important so i can only imagine how inadvertently they've put so much money into 
back into the economy. Now, again, I know the funding, government grants and shit, it's a, fin it's a, it's a dodgy game. I understand. It's really, f it's really weird. I get it. But I don't know, man. It feels like they've done, they've done way more good than bad, I feel like. I feel like they get a really bad rap on social. I don't know what people want from them. And again, if people gave Blaze a bad rap, because they thought he was a posh rich kid imagine now he's balling out of control balling like <laughs> imagine how much he got for this maybe he's kept some shares as well so in case they do go even bigger than what they are now at the moment because this is the thing too you have to imagine the value of boiler room maybe increased more over lockdown right because it felt like it was sort of dwindling and it was kind of you know not going anywhere really fast and then of course covid happens we're all locked in our homes again and then guess what's back in vogue streaming and watching sets online and then suddenly you know there was a period in time where boiler room were doing these things super naff don't get me wrong where they were kind of having people play all around the world at same you know like a stream of course you know playing sets wherever they are because they obviously couldn't fly anybody in and then they'd have kind of these scenes intersect with people maybe they're on zoom or whatnot dancing at home and raving in their bedrooms and shit like and, and it'll show the clips up on the screen bit cringe i understand but still people were lining up to be part of those things putting on their best outfits and really going for it indoors with the little lights and shit so clearly there was a kind of um a rekindling of the love of boiler room and people just kind of you know couldn't get enough of it so it, i'm sure that played a part and i'm sure these investment people don't look at those kind of things and these things were probably in the works from a long time ago but the value of that platform has definitely increased over this time 100 percent. and i'd imagine the same thing goes for dice the value of live ticketing and being able to go to these events has also increased people are being able to go out again so the connection and the kind of the deal is perfect for them at this kind of current time but I just would love to see what the people that hate Blaze and the lot are saying on social now because oh my god, oh my god, <laughs> the money is rolling in. It says um, it continues here. It says I believe deeply that the best way to boil room to evolve is by partnering with a company that values what we what we are today and provides the tools that we need to grow in the future. We play our strengths and they do theirs. Um, Dice's belief in empowering us, quote unquote. But also allowing Boiler Room to remain our own independent entity. All this will enable us to move into a new era and be the best version of ourselves. Now, you have to be honest, mate. Blaze, that ain't going to happen. More likely than not, Dice are going to absorb you. They're going to strip away everything that makes that place special, especially even to work out or whatever they do. And it's just going to, you know, essentially... I wouldn't say die, but whatever magic it had before will eventually fizzle out. That's what happens to most companies that get acquired by other companies. Um, it's very unlikely that you get to keep your essence of what you are when somebody else is essentially um, paying for you, right? Or they, they're essentially your boss now because you are your own boss. Now that person is your boss because they paid you, you know, millions and millions of dollars. And, you know, you, you effectively have to answer to them in some way, shape or form. Effective, I'm sure the cultures aren't going to mesh because if anything, I've heard some very bad stories about Dice. I'm not too sure if the guy's still there, whoever founded it or not founded it. And again, allegedly, I don't know who it is. I don't know what your name is. I've just heard stories from, from, from people. Don't sue me and come after me. But supposedly that place isn't the best place to work at. Everyone leaves because management or people in certain places are, you know, C-U-N-T-S's, which is, makes complete sense considering the platform and what they kind of do. It's very unlikely you're not going to meet a couple of C-U-N-T-S when you're kind of working in those kind of places. But again, I'm not sure what it is like working in Boiler Room. I'm not sure what it's like working at Dice, but I'd imagine those cultures aren't going to mesh too well. You're going to have create some problems to get some places. But eventually, like I said, the real big winner out of this is definitely the founder. Blade is going to be balling out of control. So congrats to him. He cashed out, kept him moving. And then everyone else that's working there, just put your head down, make as much money as you can do. If you can move up a little bit, do your thing. But if you believe that it's going to stay the same and for hours, it's, it's a bit naive. Um, but in general, this might open up opportunities for DJs going forward. This might open up opportunities for musicians and loads of other things. Because, you know, Dice, if Dice is great at one thing, it is the kind of live music ticketing sort of side of things. So maybe that's where they're sort of using or they're trying to maybe segue their way that way into that kind of field. Because I'd imagine they're going to have a say in the programming. So a lot of the content you're going to see on Boiler Room is definitely going to change over the next few months and years coming forward. You're definitely going to see people that you wouldn't never expect to see on Boiler Room. You know, there might be a set by the killers and shit on there. Soccer mummy. I don't know. Whatever. American football. I mean, you might see some really strange people on Boiler Room, but in general, you know, enjoy the time. Um, enjoy it for what it is. 
I guess it is what it is, and these platforms need to evolve. They need to make some money. I don't begrudge any of them for doing this kind of thing. And again, um, yeah, big big money. I, I'd love to know what it is that they got invested in, but again, we're never gonna find out on this course fee. Actually, we will find out. People in people in dance music love to gossip, so for sure, someone will kind of report it, um, you know, and say what the actual final figure is. But they did say it was an undisclosed sum, um, right over here. So who knows? Who knows? Who knows? But again, congratulations to both. I guess you get to see what happens going forward with both companies. Hopefully, it works out, and you know, as long as the consumer, you and I, win. It shouldn't really be that much of an issue. It shouldn't really be that much of an issue. Let's see what time we have here available. I don't want to waste too much of your time. Have I spent an hour already speaking? Yes, I have. We'll probably just quickly rattle through a few more and then I'll let you guys be. Let me see what else I need to talk about here. Buh, 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 buh. Oh yeah, let's talk about this and that we have to talk about this, right? We have to, we fucking have to. So I finally ended up watching um, the series that everyone's flipping been talking about and absolutely beating my eardrums off of about um, called Squid Game. That's available now on Netflix. I'm sure most of you have heard um, a South Korean series that's fucking phenomenal for the most part. Again, let's kind of just take a step back. Everyone else telling me to watch it, I understood why they said so because it is really good, but it's not as good as they were making it out to be. They were making it out to be like it was White the Wire or Sopranos and shit. It's good, don't get me wrong, but I think because of the the standard in kind of TV programming now is so crap. Whenever a half decent thing comes along, people get so excited that they kind of overpraise it, right? The same thing happened a little bit with Breaking Bad. I felt like, um, what's the thing called? Calling Soul, Catching Soul, whatever his name is, right? People, I think, and even Ozarks, people, I think, I lavish way too much praise on those kind of things because they recognize that that kind of programming doesn't exist anymore on TV for whatever reason. And especially stuff like Squid Game, right? Because, I've, you know, let's not beat around the bush. If this thing was made by, you know, an American company or an English company, they would have interjected so many stupid plot lines into it, loads of intersectional stuff, loads of stuff about rights and like loads of stuff that just doesn't necessarily need to be involved, doesn't need to be put into a series just because they wanted to make a social message and shit. No, just because they wanted to make a political message or something right but sometimes you need to be reminded that you can make great tv and also have a great message that has people talking about many different things has people looking at their own life and what they did and duh, 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 without it being too intersectional and way too thing about kind of you know fighting for gender rights and shit it just doesn't need to have all that stuff just focus on making great stuff and then, of course, you know, casting it amazingly if you can. Maybe if you want to make it diverse, cool. But just focus on the script and the actual, the direction, that whatever it may be, directing, whatever it may be, the color direct, the, the, the color grading, the shots, um, the composition. Make sure that's amazing. And then all those other messaging points can kind of get sprinkled in later down the line. Because that's one thing um, Squid Game did what that was absolutely phenomenal. Like legitimately one of the more enjoyable things that i've watched i was glued to it watching it kind of the other day uh the day says even if you have watched this courtesy of bbc says even if you haven't watched the show or seen the memes taken over the internet chances are you probably heard of squid game everyone's been talking about it in fact the korean series centered on a brutal survivor game is on its way to beating the regency era of romance bridgington to become the stream platform's biggest original series of all time people watch that that bridgington thing i'll try to watch again it's probably not for me again look you can only look at me to figure out i'm probably not gonna be a fan of bridgerton but i tried to watch it and it was hot garbage so the fact that that shit was gone there's so much attention from people and this again all mostly korean language um series is also garnering that same level of attention shows you that there's an appetite for really good tv people were just happy to watch bridgerton because i'm guessing it was just you know easy digestible kind of stuff right you know romance you know women love all that kind of stuff and dudes are probably caught in you know having to watch it in order to kind of keep their missus company so i get it but god damn it man if a korean if a south korean tv series can take over something like that that kind of resonated and kind of spoke to a lot of people at the same time then you know it's good it continues as while the genre of the show isn't hardly new it's striking visuals relatable characters and the disturbing study of human nature has spoken to audiences around the world in squid game a group of 456 people in debt and desperate are lured into their bloodthirsty survival game where they have a chance to walk away with 4.56 billion korean which is the equivalent to 39 million dollars if they win a series of six games the twist if they die if they lose right <laughs> incredible um 
the games are simple enough they are childhood games that players grow up playing and the surprising disposition of an innocent child's play and innocent deaths has caused the viewers to set up people are attracted by the irony that hopeless grown-ups risk their lives to win a kid's game says squid game director huang dong hyuk said in an interview the games are simple and easy so viewers can give much more focus on each character rather than the complex game rules there's also an element of nostalgia for example the dalong the dalonga honeycomb challenge featured in episode three is one of the the most it's one of Koreans most remember were playing when they were kids yeah that was brutal seeing them having to cut that honeycomb out like oh my god my my heart was beating super hard now I was thinking this is one thing I was thinking a lot about because I remember I was going to make a little topic about it on the podcast but I, I kind of lost the article but there's a lot of people on social a few weeks ago who were kind of laughing at this guy this English dude who was um a he kind of won the lottery and he was basically a builder dude right who kind of you know loved kind of wearing gold jewelry big dude beer belly um you know just la a proper lad and he won the lottery and i think he just went and bought like a gold car a gold you know that kind of that kind of um character that kind of episode in, in simpsons where he buys like a gold car and a gold house right he just spent on just crazy shit and i remember the time everyone kind of you know the social media um fan business advisors and financial gurus were like oh he should have bought this he should have done that he should have done this right and eventually most of the stuff that this guy said was true he did lose most of his money and i think the recent story that everyone was laughing at was that he'd now have returned back to the building site that he was at previously he'd got gone back to kind of being a quote-unquote laborer and everyone was laughing and saying see that's why people don't shoot and play lottery because you waste all your you know the money's all gone you go back broke again da, da, da. he should have made more investments all this sort of stuff right but i think the reality is in life most of us especially the ones who aren't that ambitious who are not that ambitious who probably aren't that um who don't enjoy taking many risks we're never really going to enjoy or never really going to have the possibility of ever, ever. And again, I'm not counting myself because I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a risk taker when it comes to that thing. But I think most people, and again, I'm not really a big believer in everyone should be an entrepreneur and go for their dreams and shit. I think that's kind of bullshit. I think everyone needs to play their position. But I do think that people that kind of judge too much about these things, you have to understand that most people aren't going to ever feel, taste, understand what it means to have that much disposable income at your disposal right that much money like they would never see it they're never going to see six seven eight ten figures on their bank account it's never going to happen so it's hard to judge what somebody should do when you've never actually even held a couple of grand in your hand for longer than two months like it's always kind of gone and been spent on somewhere you've got itchy fingers so imagine if you won the lottery and even after taxes you still got you know 4.5 million just sitting in your account comfy and you come from a general working class background of course you're gonna go nuts and do some crazy shit of course you are but i also think isn't that what life is about shouldn't you be allowed to just go crazy and do some nonsense for seven years five years two years however long that money lasts you and then if you have to go back and work a normal job so what you've been you've been working normal jobs for most of your life anyway it's not as if you spent most of your life being rich and you have to go work for a normal job that's when it kind of gets becomes a mind fuck right when you spend the majority of your life being a rich kid and then suddenly you get into adult age you don't have any money you have to kind of get back into working normal work and going to do your own shopping and shit and not having a butler that's going to be a mind but if you spent the majority of your life 10 20 years 30 years being just a regular regular everyday person working a nine to five and then you have a five-year gap where you get to ball out and enjoy your lottery win isn't that far more beneficial than just laboring and kind of waste not wasting your time but essentially just clocking in clocking out at a mundane job that you don't really enjoy there's, I don't see either thing as being better than the other. I just see them being on the same sort of plane, really, of existence. One existence, you get to kind of suspend belief and kind of live in this kind of fairyland and kind of have a bit of arrested development for a couple of years with your wealth. You won a lottery. And one, you get to pretend like you're enjoying life by just clocking in and clocking out and having a couple of holidays per year, maybe going to have a couple of stakes at the Hawks Moor, whatnot. That's not really like you're not really going for anything as well. Do you know what I mean? It's not as if you're going to lose your job anytime soon. Hopefully, God, for God willing, like these restaurants aren't going to go anywhere anytime soon. You're still going to be safe. You're going to be stable. Your kids should be okay for the most part. It is what it is. Um, so I, I think the great thing about this game is that it did show that 
as much as obviously it was hurtful, I guess for the families attached, if somebody that you love goes missing and they just turn up dead, or they even turn up dead, they they get incinerated. You have no record of what happened to them, what their last days were like, nothing. But you just know they went to try and play this game and attempt to clear their debts that were crippling enough for them to risk going um, to a far flung island to go play this flipping crazy death game. Still, like. I don't know, man, like just living for the sake of living, just so you can say you've lived up until a certain amount of years. Is that really what living should be like, especially if you're not doing it on your own terms, especially if you're crippled by debt in the first place? Why not take the risk? Why not? Obviously, the everything else that got involved in it, it's a bit dark when, you know, they have to play them. They play them. They play each other. Off each, they play them off each other. The VIPs that come in, that gets a bit sadistic, especially when it gets into that whole, you know, guy. He, he takes one of the butlers back into his flipping fit. Like, yeah, I know there's a lot of questionable things in there in general. But I think what it sort of addresses and what it kind of exposes the kind of game of life itself and the fact that we all kind of believe in these systems that have been created essentially just numbers on the screen that get fuddled around and if you're the right person or you're from a right background you get to fuddle these numbers more you get to go in prison less you get to go in prison more. like all these flipping things that don't make any quite sense that we're not really kind of grappling with kind of black mirror-esque they, they kind of expose on the show it kind of really exposed the entire thing of what people are up to and again the main guy in it is like a complete piece of shit right like he essentially leaves his mum for dead right comes back and she's essentially again like on the floor dying right oh well, she's already dead i think she's on the floor um he doesn't look after his kid he steals money from his you know mum who looks like she's got many you know looks at what she got she got a fungi foot right that might need to be amputated like terrible people all of them no one comes out of this no one's got any redeeming guys about it. everyone's got a really dodgy crappy past and it's interesting too that there is this link like because you owe a lot of money there's generally other parts of your life that are definitely going to be super chaotic which i'm not sure how true that is because i think a lot of people you know it's not like having student debt or something that you know most of us have this is like people that have like crazy debt like debt like you know in the hundreds and thousands and that it's funny that they kind of equate that with also having other destructive tendencies, other kind of really dark shit that you have going on in your life, like you've not told anybody about. That's the interesting part of it, which I don't know if that's true or not. If people that have those kind of high debts also have some, you know, other things going on, which I'd assume they would do because, you know, this is the guy that flipping lied about his mum, how much money he needed and then took that money to go bet on the horses and lost it all. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just... <sighs> I don't know, man. I don't know. But yeah, great series overall. Again, slightly overrated in terms of how people are going about it. But again, I understand because if you're watching Ted Lasso and you're watching this, I get why you're going to be, you know, wanking under the table watching it for sure. Um, definitely want to check out. So definitely check out um, what's that thing? Squid Game available now on um, on Netflix. Definitely a standout show. And as you can see from these headlines at Billboard, Netflix hit record Squid um, Game extends content fueled rally. Um, Netflix shares closed at record high on Thursday. The latest sign that the Wall Street optimistic and steady stream of hit shows will keep subscribers coming. Again, this is what all the people, this is all the geeks and people that were complaining about Star Wars under the Kathleen Kennedy's reign were complaining about. Like, if you actually make good shit and we like it as fans, we're going to watch it and talk about it endlessly. So just imagine if they just make good shit, like this would increase their share prices, everyone would get paid well, but instead they're all lapped up and obsessed with politics and representation. It's just nonsense. Just make good things, cost them well, and everyone will be happy. Instead of trying to shoehorn, you know, political messages and shit in the made up world. Like it's Star Wars, we're gonna say I don't know. Anyway, recent stock gains have been fueled by the rerun, return story of debut of well known titles, including the new season of The Witcher, the sitcom Seinfeld, and the latest list has been the South Korean action drama series Squid Game, whose massive popularity appears to be early indicator of the strong user trends Bloomberg just wrote. Um and then you've got one last one here, Squid Game Director reveals more about Gungu yourself man character. We don't really see much of him. I think we've only seen him from two episodes, but still brilliant, brilliant, brilliant stuff. Definitely check it out if you haven't already. Squid Game available now on Netflix. Definitely one of the better things to watch in a long, long time. Definitely check it out if you haven't already. Anyway, that is the Action Zing Show episode number 503. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. If you're the first one to check out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you listen for the podcast, please leave me a five-star review. I beg of you, please. 
or four or three or two or one i know i've got really dry hands here so you know it is what it is please leave me a review that'd be greatly appreciated it's all i ask of you today and again i'll see each other we'll see each other or we'll hear each other very very soon take care be safe um thanks again for tuning in and just you know engaging with the content any way you can it's always appreciated and never expected so thank you for lending me whatever time you have and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe peace